In 2018, a roller coaster in Daytona, Florida would derail. Its story leading up to that incident, however, goes back decades. Multiple times, this roller coaster would be installed at a theme park that shortly after would end up closed and abandoned. You could say that this Pinfari Zyklon was cursed. This roller coaster, it wasn't a matter of if a tragedy was going to happen, it was just a matter of when a tragedy was going to happen. In 1926, Italian company Pinfari began building and maintaining Dodgem cars. In 1965, they would introduce their first Cyclone range of roller coasters, a compact, simple attraction that could easily be transported. The new coasters were extremely popular with traveling fairs and smaller amusement parks due to the small size and cost. Many of the Cyclone coasters built found themselves moving all over the world to provide family fun. Over 200 of all different sizes, shapes, and layouts were created over the existence of Pimfari. While many of the coasters built have interesting stories, there is one that is perhaps more troubled than most. In Addison, Illinois, a restaurant and tavern known as Paul's Picnic Grove would be sold and turned into an amusement park, Storybook Land, and later Storybook USA. Offering a small selection of rides, the park ran into financial difficulty and was sold in 1961 to Doral Everding, whose family owned and operated Santa's Village. While Santa's Village was aimed at younger children, trying to offer something different, this new, updated park, now called Adventureland, would try and appeal to young adults with a host of new rides. In 1968, the park added a roller coaster, the Italian Bobs, a Pinfari Cyclon the smaller of what would become two Zyklons in the park. The following year for the park's ninth season, Adventureland opened their second roller coaster, the larger Zyklon Z, <coughs> Z64 version, the Super Italian Bobs. Built by the park as the most spectacular amusement ride in the world, the brand new world's largest all steel roller coaster imported directly from Milan, Italy. Hmm. Many places reported the coaster originally opened in 1975. However, newspapers date back to 1969, promoting the addition of this new coaster. The park pledged that they would provide the finest rides made anywhere in the world, and they would grow into the largest amusement park in Illinois. Both roller coasters in Adventureland were named after the Bobs, which was a closed roller coaster at Riverview, once billed as the world's fastest roller coaster. As with many new roller coasters of the time, much of what was offered was over-exaggerated in the park's marketing. Both the Italian Bobs and Super Italian Bobs were extremely popular and Adventureland was loved by locals who visited. After Doral Everding passed away in 1970, a group of investors purchased the park. It wouldn't be long until Illinois' competition for amusement parks would begin to heat up, with Marriott's Great America opening in 1976. Adventureland had become increasingly run down after the sale and was known to be unsafe. After the 1977 season, the park closed, never to reopen again. The rides were sold and the Super Italian Bobs would find itself moving to a new park. It's something great to see As thrilling as can be A city full of legend And mixed with history you will find much pleasure at Legend City for your family. Let's try this again. This Western theme park was planned to be Arizona's answer to Disneyland. The result of a dream of one man, Lewis Crandall. He would take ideas he liked from other parks around the US and combine them into one immersive offering. The park design was completed by Randall Duell and opened on June 29, 1963 as the fifth largest theme park in the United States. 
Legend City was a big deal in Arizona, a beautiful park that could rival most other offerings in the US. And for many kids growing up in the 60s and 70s near Phoenix, it did become their Disneyland. While Lewis Crandall had his dream of creating a park in Arizona, it sadly would be his business experience that would fail him. Almost immediately, the park had financial issues. Unexpected costs rose quickly. Visitor levels did not meet the expected amount. Within a year of opening, Crandall was bankrupt, losing everything he had built. After his departure, the park struggled on before going into receivership, closing in September 1966, just three years after it had its grand opening. After sitting abandoned for two years, an unlikely businessman would purchase the park and bring it back to life, Leonard Schoen. The man behind U-Haul purchased the park in 1969, investing millions of dollars to bring it back to life. This new version of the park was a long way from the original fully themed experience and was turned into more of an amusement park. This change only increased throughout the 1970s, with multiple owners coming and going. After Shoen sold the park, a Japanese amusement park manufacturer, Continental Recreation, took over and within two years, profits fell and the park closed again in 1974. Again, it reopened. This time in 1976, when traveling carnival operators, the Kapow family would bring it back to life for the third time. It would be during this era that the Zyklon Coaster, Super Italian Bobs from the closed Adventureland would be purchased and installed at the park. Legend City was finally making some money and the installation of the 65 foot tall coaster was bringing people in. The 100 ton ride was transported to the park and lit up at night with over 4,500 lights. To name the new coaster, they ran a contest that brought in up to 1,000 letters a day from fans, hoping their name choice was selected. The winner would receive a season pass to Legend City, dinner, and a ride on the new attraction. Now called Sidewinder, the roller coaster opened at its second location at Legend City in July 1978. While the park was now making money, questions were arising about the ride safety at the park and poor maintenance which sadly resulted in multiple injuries. Legend City's ultimate downfall would be the land under the park. It was highly sought after and increasing in value. A Canadian company purchased the park in 1983 and sold it to the Salt River Project with intentions to use the land as their new headquarters. Legend City closed its doors again on September 4th, 1983, five years after Sidewinder had opened. The Zyklon Coaster had now operated in two parks that were closed. A curse of the Zyklon seemed to be forming. In March 1984, all of the rides, signs and buildings went up for auction. Everything that wasn't sold was bulldozed and Legend City would become just a legend left to history. It's something great to see As thrilling as can be A city full of legend and mixed with history You will find much pleasure at Legend City For your family The roller coaster, however, would move on yet again In Custer, South Dakota, 20 miles from Mount Rushmore Chief Enterprises, owned and operated by the Schultz family Who also own multiple properties in the area Would open a brand new $5 million amusement park Taking up two square blocks in the downtown area, Wild West World planned to incorporate an arcade, hotel, restaurant, and amusement rides, all with an Old West theme. The highlight attraction of the new amusement park would be the former Sidewinder Coaster in its third home. After multiple delays, it opened once again in July 1984, this time costing four 50 cent tokens to ride. Schultz stated that Wild West World is a $5 million big risk, but one that could not be faulted. It will do well and will be one of the biggest attractions in the Black Hills. No doubt about it, in two to five years, people would come just to see it. There just isn't any reason for it not to be. A year later, in September 1985, the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. People visiting Mount Rushmore were not really interested in riding a roller coaster, and attendance was not what was expected. Schultz blamed the weather. Could it be the curse of the Zyklon struck again? A year later, Wild West World hoped to try again under new management. 
Due to the bankruptcy, the rides were returned to the company they were purchased from, Dot Amusement Inc. of Arizona, the same company who operated Legend City before it closed. Fifteen of the rides at Wild West World all operated at Legend City. They decided to keep them in Custer and try to reopen the park themselves. Bill Kapow, owner of the company, hoped his family experience in amusement parks would help make it a success. It did not. The coaster was sold again and the park closed for good. Generations of families from across Pennsylvania have special memories of Bland's Park. Since its beginnings around the turn of the century, Bland's Park has been a source of family entertainment. This time, the 1,710 feet of track moved to Pennsylvania. Established in 1907, the Bland family farm evolved into a small amusement park. Located in Tipton, the park opened Zyklon for the 1987 season at the home of Old Fashioned Fun. The Zyklon roller coaster quickly became a memory maker for park visitors. Zyklon found popularity within the park and operated successfully with many happy visitors experiencing the ride. After over 15 years of operation, it was removed and relocated to make way for the new Crazy Mouse roller coaster and the park's biggest ever expansion. The curse was broken, and the park still exists today, called Del Grosso's Amusement Park. The Zyklon Coaster was now over 30 years old, but its story would not end there. In Newcastle, Delaware, Blue Diamond Action Sports Park opened in 2002 as an ATV and motocross track. The following year, they began to think about adding amusement rides in hope of expanding their customer base becoming one of the first amusement parks in the state of Delaware. They purchased Cyclone for $100,000 and brought in a team to reconstruct the coaster who would use 16 tractors to haul it to the site after they removed all the snow. Now called the Blue Diamond Streak, it would be the only roller coaster in Delaware. I'm telling you, Ernie, I am so impressed what you have done to this place. It's unbelievable. This is our own Six Flags right here under the, the, the Delaware flag. The team assembled the coaster in four days. When asked why he brought a coaster to the sports center, Nick Ferrara Jr., the developer behind the plan, said he was motivated by the fact that it was exciting and was totally different to anything he had done before. He said, this is how Walt Disney started. The ride's opening was delayed due to poor weather from Memorial Day 2004 to June 11. The new park would charge $10 for an all-attraction pass to experience the park's offerings at the somewhat unusual amusement park. While the idea was initially popular, the business was not sustainable and all of the rides were closed after the 2007 season. After four years operating at the site, the Zyklon sat standing but not operating for over two years. Even a million dollars of advertising could not save the amusement park slash sports complex idea. It just didn't work. Ferrara said that while the park did not turn a profit, he had a great time trying. He ran the coaster every week so as to help maintain it while it just sat abandoned at the location, just in case potential buyers wanted to go for a ride to test it out. He was surprised that the coaster had not been snapped up. The curse was back and the coaster found itself once again in a closed amusement park. Nick Ferrara listed his rides for sale on eBay, including the coaster for $225,000. It didn't sell. 18 months later, in January 2012, it was sold privately for around $150,000. Just like many people, the roller coaster would retire to Florida, its final location. It's called the Sand Blaster, aptly named because it's going to blast folks into the sky and back along the ocean front in Daytona Beach. This comes a year and a half after some local businessmen rescued a roller coaster from a closed park in Delaware, dismantled it, refurbished it, and put it up again. The winner of the auction will be Boardwalk Amusements LTD in Daytona Beach, Florida. The small Boardwalk Amusement Park would lease the land to the new owners and open their first ever roller coaster. After a delayed construction due to issues refurbishing it in a shop in Palmetto, it would now be called Sand Blaster, opening in late 2013. The now 44-year-old roller coaster will become the oldest non-traveling roller coaster in the state. Today, that record is held by Space Mountain at Magic Kingdom. 
We'll talk about Starliner another time. Never been a roller coaster in Daytona Beach before. Ed Kennedy and his partner are anxious to get the go ahead. Though inspectors found a few minor blemishes that needed to be hammered out. Sam Blaster's grand opening was attended by a group of invited media and Florida Governor Rick Scott. The governor cut the ribbon for the ride, but declined to take a ride. He said, maybe next time. Sand Blaster was planned to operate year-round, offering great views of the area. The new location was popular, with many visitors hoping to hop onto the classic yet cursed coaster. For a few years, it seemed successful. <laughs> But by 2017, the ride was regularly shut, leaving many confused as to why it was never open. Many thought it would never reopen again. The real reason was that after four years in the small park, safety was becoming a concern. The owners owed tens of thousands of dollars in back taxes, and the coaster had over a dozen safety violations. The state inspected the coaster in February of 2017 and found numerous issues with the ride, citing harsh, salty air and storms for causing the problems. Some of the more than a dozen issues that included a damaged handrail, safety cables not properly secured, worn and damaged braces, seats not properly secured, and cracked supports. In February 2017, the roller coaster was given a stop order because of corrosion and damaged handrails after an inspection by the state. Two further stop orders came in following inspections when they found damaged nuts and bolts on the ride along with a broken seat. Each time an order came in, the owners tried to bring it up to code. State inspectors continued to check the attraction for safety. Eventually, after another round of thorough inspections, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services found Sand Blaster in compliance with state law. It was allowed to reopen after seven months of closures. Less than a year later, on the same day the ride would be inspected again and given a pass, a tragic incident would occur. Breaking now with 11 terrifying moments as a roller coaster derails at Daytona Beach Pier. Video from eyewitnesses shows riders dangling upside down. We have live team coverage on the chaos along the coast. On June 14th, 2018, around 8.30 p.m., multiple riders would be injured when the front car of the ride would derail completely with 10 passengers on board. As the train went round the track, the car in the front slid off the tracks and would hang off the side dangling. Two of the passengers in the front car would fall 34 feet being severely injured. Two other passengers were dangling between the supports and the hanging train. The second car of the train would also derail with a further four passengers inside with the third car that was carrying two passengers luckily stationary still on the track. Those nearby heard unusual banging as the train came around the turn. Ride workers grabbed ladders to try and help those hanging above. Eventually, firefighters climbed up to rescue the remaining eight passengers. Nine of the ten passengers were taken to hospital, and at first, nobody knew what had happened. After an inspection, the reason for the derailment was deemed as due to excessive speed on the section at 22 miles per hour, as well as operator error for running the attraction at that speed in the conditions outside. Gubernatorial candidate Adam Putnam says his agency recently found evidence the sandblaster had derailed on previous occasions, something Putnam claims the owners never reported. They are not the types of things that would have been uh, seen to the naked eye by our investigators. Many of the daily required safety inspection reports that was required by law by the roller coaster operator had gone missing or were incomplete. On the day of the incident, the daily report stated no issues were found. Broadway at Daytona Development, the owners of the oceanfront property later filed a complaint in the courts against the roller coaster's owner, Boardwalk Amusement Rides. 
A new fight is underway over the future of this roller coaster, which has not operated since the incident. The landlord company notified the coaster's owner in early 2018 that the rights to occupy the premises under a lease would end in March. They ignored it, and a few months later, the coaster derailed. They again asked for the coaster to be removed in July after the incident, filing the complaint to try and get it gone. The case was later dismissed, as the now old, many times refurbished Sandblaster was finally removed in November 2019, never to be seen again. The curse of the Zyklon was over. As the ride was removed, some of the passengers were still recovering from their injuries. In reality, this old coaster wasn't really cursed. In fact, its story is one of the most fascinating and saddest of any roller coaster. An attraction that was regularly let down by the places who purchased it. Just another roller coaster that due to its cost, ease of transportation, and size, was passed around after failure after failure. Many times during its life, this Zyklon was an icon of hope for wherever it was installed, promising bigger and better things at parks starting out full of promise. It was a roller coaster that saw it all, from struggling businessmen trying to evoke nostalgia of the past, to dreamers of new ideas that promised something big, to those who were looking for a cheap ride to boost profit. Out of six different locations around the United States that the roller coaster was installed, four are now just extinct, failed amusement parks, remembered by memories. One was successful in the middle of its life, where it was remembered fondly, and one ended in the worst way possible. Sadly, it is a ride that will be remembered forever for that one thing, derailing due to the poor decisions of its owners that ultimately ended its 50 years of existence with a tragic accident. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Expedition Extinct. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to join the expedition. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates on upcoming episodes. And a special thank you to our patrons for supporting the channel. We will see you next time.